Don't forget, ko-fi.com slash stop writing alone is a real simple way to show your support for what's going on here week after week. Hi, everyone. This is Nicole Rivera, and this is the Stop Writing Alone podcast for writers who are looking for their writing community. I know you want to find readers for your work, but I think your first step is to connect with other writers. That's what we're going to do here in the Stop Writing Alone podcast. We'll do writing prompts and other writing group activities, discover online writing communities, learn how to find local writing groups, or how to make your own. Join us as we explore, learn, and write. Hi, this is Nicole Rivera, and you're listening to the Stop Writing Alone podcast. One of the great gifts that I gave to myself in the month of June was the decision to reread Writing Down the Bones. I was thinking it would be great to read a craft book with the group uh, in the Stop Writing Alone Happy Campers Club, and I kept looking at all my writing books, and I was like, God, I, you know, I'm always recommending Writing Down the Bones, and I'm always you know, I have these fond memories of the first time that I read through it and how much permission I got as a writer from reading it through the first time. But aside from a a couple of sections that I constantly refer to, I really didn't remember the entire text. And I said, um, you know, has anyone else read this? And a couple of people had, but not everyone had. So I said, all right, I'm going to reread it. And if anybody wants to read it along with me, um, we'll have a chat about it, you know, once a week. And so it's, it's come and gone. The month went by so quickly. We broke it down into four different sections so that, you know, we wouldn't have to read an entire book in a week in, you know, in addition to doing all of our writing. But I wanted to just share with you this week some of the big takeaways. Some of them, yes, are, are things that I remembered and constantly referred to when thinking of this book over the years. Um, but so many of them were things that I had forgotten. Um, and it's what's, what's so beautiful is the, the great reminders that I got, the permission that I got once again uh, from Natalie to, to sort of really just dive into the soul of my writing. But the other thing that I was like so um, happy with was how much of what I read in this book I, I had already internalized. And I thought, wow, you know, this is stuff that, that sort of like tugged at me the first time I re- read it, thinking, wow, wouldn't it be great? to like feel the way she's feeling about my writing, about, uh, you know, the freedom to come to the page in such a way. And now here I am. And, and honestly, it has to be about a decade later. I, I do believe the first time I read this book was either 2010 or 2011. Uh, and, and so much of it is, uh, is the way that I, I see this whole journey. So I am going to limit myself to 10 takeaways from Natalie Goldberg's Writing Down the Bones, freeing the writer with them. But I will tell you, as I've probably said before in this podcast, but in case I haven't, if you have not read this book, I do believe it is one that should be on every writer's bookshelf, not only to read cover to cover in this, in the way that I've done uh, these times, but also as I've used it for the past 10 years, each chapter is kind of like a mini essay. This is a, it's a very easy read and you could just always pluck it off the shelf, open up to a section, read that one section and sort of be good with it. I mean, it doesn't have to be read cover to cover and every little chapter is more like a a, a tiny personal essay, a snippet into the writing life, the creative life. Um, And it's just really a wonderful little book. I mean, mine's a little, I have a little hardcover edition, but everybody had like a different copy. So let's get to it. Limiting myself to only 10 takeaways. I'm going to start right from the beginning and see how far I get. So one of the first things that jumped off the page to me was like right in the introduction 
when Natalie talks about her first sort of understanding that she could write about whatever she wanted. She was looking in a bookstore and she found a book and it was a book about eggplants, about how to cook eggplants. And she said, what? This entire book (laughs) is about eggplants? I could write about anything. And I just love that. Um, And as soon as I read it this time, I remembered reading it the first time. And I hadn't ever run into a book about eggplants. But reading Natalie's reflection about it, I kind of lived through her and thought, could I? Could I really write about anything? And I'm not sure that I mentioned this on this podcast before, but since I mention it everywhere else, I will give you my new lesson in, yes, you can write anything. And that comes from uh, an encounter I had in a Twitter chat many, many years ago. It was a, it was a chat for writers I'm not sure which one it was that I was in. And I just sort of started up a side conversation with one of the other writers there and and asked them, what do you write? And they said they wrote dragon erotica. And I was like, what is that? I don't even know what dragon erotica is. And I didn't get into the details of really asking what exactly it was. But I, you know, I sort of probed further in asking, like, are you serious? And uh, because, again, (laughs) I had no context for this (laughs) whatsoever. And and the writer wrote back, yeah, I I write it. And there's a there's a pretty um, faithful audience. I've been making money at writing Dragon Erotica for a number of years. And that was my book on the eggplant personal story when I said to myself well then if this person can write dragon erotica and make money at it then I literally can write whatever I want so Natalie Goldberg says it in writing down the bones I'm telling you now and I tell everyone who will listen whatever it is you want to write whatever it is you actually want to do in this world you can do it. Your only job then is to find your audience, just like Dragon Erotica Lady or man. I don't even know if it was a a, um, a male or female author that I was talking to, but they found their audience and they were making money writing Dragon Erotica. So, uh, you know, Natalie says, I could say what I wanted. Trust in what you love continue to do it and it will take you where you need to go I love it that is my my first takeaway from the first time I read it and it just underscored my my own personal lessons when I read it again now and if it's not something that you have fully embraced yet please understand that you can write whatever it is you want to write and once you do so the only work left is to find your readers and sometimes that's easier than other times but that doesn't mean that your audience is not out there the second big takeaway from from natalie's book writing down the bones is in her section entitled writing as a practice and this is something that she echoes throughout the entire book and really all of her teachings And that is this simple fact that when we're talking about a sports team, and I believe she gave the example of a football team, we talk about a football team, no one questions a football team going out and doing practice week after week after week, you know, to prepare for this one big game at the end of the month or what have you. I guess it would be practice day after day after day for the the game at the end of the week. However, as writers, we put ourselves into this position that every single time we show up to the page, it's the big game. Every single time we sit down to write, we have to be working on something. 
either our next novel or our next piece to be published or submitted somewhere. And what she argues is that you have to be able to sit down with the least expectation of yourself. You just sit down and you give yourself a moment to write down whatever's running through you and you use that space and time as practice. You just keep showing up to practice, practice, practice. And then you have separate times where you show up for the big game. And again, whatever that is to you, if that's going to be a novel, if that's going to be um, some other piece that a short story or poetry, whatever it may be, her argument is that we should be making time to simply write for the sake of writing as a practice so that we can get better and better. And one of the things that she does is that she she challenges herself to fill a notebook a month. So she says she goes to, I mean, I, I should preface this by reminding you, um, if you don't already know, that this book was written a long time ago. Um, just checking the copyright here. It was 1986 when Writing Down the Bones was originally published. So um, anyway, the point is Natalie says that she would go out to, um, so, you know, school supply store during, you know, back to school sales and just buy a bunch of single subject notebooks, like little spiral notebooks that had all the characters on them and just stock up for the year when there's a sale. And, you know, we still have those sales now. Staples used to do a really awesome sale for teachers where I could get those notebooks for like a penny. I don't think they do that anymore. <laughs> anyway, a, a s- simple single subject spiral notebook and every single month she fills one up with what? Practice. Just sit down, write, spill out her brain and and that is that. Um, so I tried <laughs> in June. Once we read this, I, I said to the happy campers, I said, I am going to try to do the notebook this month, the practice notebook. And I got myself, you know, I know I'm not the only one. I have a box of notebooks in my house. So I went to my box of notebooks and I found a plain, ordinary uh, composition notebook. I said, oh, that's, I don't have my spiral notebooks anymore, but I have a composition notebook. That's what I'll use. And I brought it to the Happy Campus Club. I said, this is my goal. I'm going to finish this notebook in the month of June. I did not reach that goal, ladies and gentlemen. And I, um, I know that part of the reason is that I did not realize when I grabbed the notebook that it was college ruled. <laughs> but I did make it to the halfway point of the notebook. And it was really interesting. In fact, I haven't reread it yet. I should have probably reread it before doing this reflection to see what's in there I'm really curious to see what happened because the the interesting thing about doing practice in the way that uh, Natalie suggests is that you just keep going and you're not really thinking and you're in the flow of the moment um so I didn't feel so attached to the words that I have this great memory of them but uh she says that you know when we do this there's there's just beauty in there that you forget about when you when you finally do go back to reread it. So that should be interesting, and I will get back to you to let you know if that's the case. But either way, I think she's got a, an, a, an incredible argument when it comes to taking time to practice and whether or not you fill a notebook in a month or you just allow yourself to play in that way uh, you know, more times than you normally would. I think it's something to think about. A third takeaway came from uh, the section entitled Artistic Stability. And the quote that I have here uh, marked off is, if you are not afraid of the voices inside you, you will not fear the critics outside you. She further says, we are not running wildly after beauty with fear at our backs. So this, 
again, topic that comes up a number of times in the book about really examining the, you know, how we're speaking to ourselves internally and garnering strength from that. Because once we can conquer those inner critics, if you, if you can't say anything to yourself, then no one else can really get near you. And this was echoed by, I should say, that at the same time that I was reading this book, I was reading The Four Agreements with the Rich Lit Society. That's a group uh, run by Sean Croxton, who has the Quote of the Day podcast. I highly recommend the podcast. I highly recommend the Rich Lit Society if you're looking for an online um, book club that really like dives deep on some of these books. Anyway, we were reading The Four Agreements, and one of the four agreements is don't take things personally. And essentially what it's saying is that when people say things to you and in terms, you know, in the context of this conversation, if somebody is critiquing you, your work, your work ethic, whatever it is you're writing, um, and if you are hurt by that critique, it's really because you have some sort of wound internally that this person this critic has found you know and if taking it back to Natalie's suggestion here which is also uh, echoed by uh, Ruiz in the four agreements that if you can heal that wound yourself if you can tackle your own internal critic then they can't hurt you with with these critiques and you can take things in a more constructive way and not necessarily feel the fear or um or any type of uh, personal you know offense from those types of things so i i guess it's i love that that natalie said it i love that i was getting it like uh from two different inputs of uh of the books that I was reading last month but also I just I do believe that there's so much to that you know um I always say and I've I've said it before in this podcast that when we critique each other's writing and when we receive critique we have to remember that the critique is about the work and not about it's about the writing not the writer uh and Many times that's a lot easier said than done. It is so hard to hear criticism of our own personal creative outputs and not feel like that's a critique of us because these works are so personal to us. But this is exactly um, the type of work that Natalie's suggesting we do, you know, like really work on not being such a harsh critic of yourself and uh and then you will be able to hear things from the place that they're coming so um yeah i really did love that that's followed up by the way by the next section i feel like i should get a freebie on this i don't really want to use one of my 10 takeaways on this let's say this is takeaway four but i might take 11 takeaways then so takeaway four is the the one one of the sections that I pull this book off my shelf for time and time again. So you guys know I love writing prompts. You know I love writing exercises. Natalie Goldberg has in Writing Down the Bones a section that is called A List of Topics for Writing Practice. So as I mentioned, she wants us to practice all the time. Uh, you know, do some writing that doesn't have a destination. And she's got this one section in her book, which in my book is on uh, page 25, where she just lists, let me see, how many topics is it? 15 different quick topics that you could just sit down at the page and just go. Number one, tell about the quality of light coming in through your window. Just like sit down, look at the light coming through your window, write. Number two, and she says, like, even if it's dark, go for it, just go. Because there's always, if you're sitting and you're seeing, there's light coming from somewhere. Uh, Number two, begin with, I remember. Write lots of small memories. If you get stuck, just repeat the phrase, I remember, again, and keep going. 
Number three, I'm not going to read the whole list. I'll read five of them for you. (laughs) Number three, take something you feel strongly about, whether it is positive or negative, and write about it as though you love it. Go as far as you can go, then flip over the page and write about the same thing as though you hate it. Then write about it perfectly neutral. Number four, choose a color. I actually, number four, I actually used on one of the YouTube writing prompts so this will sound familiar choose a color and take a 15 minute walk on your walk notice wherever you see the color come back to your notebook and write for 15 minutes number five write in different places I mean this list goes on and some of them are simple like write in different places some of them are a little bit more detailed but either way it is 15 different things that you can just sit down and write. I love that. That will always be a takeaway for this book for me. That is, um, I, my book has one of those little like ribbon bookmarks in it. That is where my ribbon stays all the time because every time I'm pulling the book off the shelf, I'm just looking for that. Um, yeah. So huge takeaway from writing down the bones. Takeaway number five comes from the section simply called obsessions and Natalie suggests that you sit down and write down the things you're obsessed with and she says basically when it becomes an obsession you will naturally write about it so we all have things that we're obsessed with and it's going to come out in our writing one way or another so she says it's time to really embrace it and sometimes to show up to the page and just just write about it. Let it happen. Don't fight it because it's going to come through anyway. So um, if you are about to write something and you don't want your obsession to come out, she says, give your obsession some time, like sit down and say, let me write about my obsession. So for example, her obsession, she said one of her obsessions was that uh, her Jewish family, her culture, everything. She said, no matter what I did, there was always like a Jewish family or a character or something in my work. So I sit down and I write a little bit about, you know, a young girl who's Jewish and what this means. And either she becomes part of the piece that I'm going to write, or I get it out of my system, turn the page and start the next thing. So I love this for two reasons. One is that, yeah, I can't ignore it, right? I have obsessions and they do show up in my writing. And I often am reactive. I'm like, oh man, I'm writing about that thing again. So I love this idea of taking the moment to stop and first really list them. What are the things that I'm obsessed with that are probably going to show up in my writing a lot? And, And then two, like, instead of being reactive about it, proactively go in knowing this is going to be on your mind. Do you want it in this story or not? You know, if you want to let it roam free, then just get started in your writing. If you want to control it a bit, give it its moment and then move on. Very interesting advice because as I'm sure you know, if you've been listening to this podcast one of my obsessions is and will always be teaching. <laughs> and that does get me into trouble, particularly when I'm writing YA, where I should be writing more about the students or the the young adults and not the adults that may be in their lives in the form of the teachers around them. This is not their story, right? So um, really finding a way to have those characters be in the background and not take over because of, you know, my, my natural obsessive compulsion about (laughs) discussing them is really important. Um, so yeah, love that big takeaway. That's takeaway number five. I only have five left. So let's see what's next. Takeaway number six is baking a cake. I love this section and this is one of those that I love so much and I did forget about. So when I reread it, I was like, oh yes, this is, this is it. So I'm just going to read uh, the first paragraph and a half of Baking a Cake, which in my book is on page 58. Natalie writes, when you bake a cake, you have ingredients, sugar, flour, butter, baking soda, eggs, milk. You put them in a bowl and mix them up. But this does not make a cake. 
this makes goop. You have to put them in the oven and add heat or energy to transform it into a cake. And the cake looks nothing like its original ingredients. It's a lot like parents unable to claim their hippie kids as their own in the 60s. Milk and eggs look at their pound cake and say, not ours. Not egg, milk, not egg, not milk, but PhD daughter of refugee parents, a foreigner in her own home. In a sense, this is what writing is like. You have all these ingredients, the details of your life. But just to list them is not enough. I was born in Brooklyn. I have a mother and a father. I am female. You must add the heat and energy of your heart. I love this. I love this idea. I love this sentiment. We can't have one without the other, right? So you can't have a cake without having the eggs, the flour, all those ingredients. But you can't have the cake if you don't have the heat and energy to transform it. Again, same in writing. We can't have, she says later in the section, a a really tasty cake if we don't have lots of different types of ingredients. We need that, that whole list. So we need to show up to life and live it. So that, you know, if I'm, only living in my house, which I've been doing, God help me, for all these months and not going out a lot. Well, now it feels like I'm living uh, an, an eggs and flour kind of life. Like I don't, I don't have my baking soda. I don't have the sugar that I need to really make this, this full delicious cake. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to find it in different ways, right? So, but anyway, the point is we have to live a full life so that we have all the ingredients we need to to make a cake but the skill of writing comes from all of this transformation that we do you know we can line up 10 different people that have really amazing lives not all of them are going to be writers so it's the twofold you can be somebody (laughs) oh man I gotta find the section hold on a second so later in the section she says There are people who try to use heat only without the ingredients to make a cake. The heat is cozy and feels good, but when you're done, there's not much there for anyone else to eat. That's usually abstract writing. We get a sense that there's a great warmth there, but we have nothing to bite into. If you use details, you become better skilled at conveying your ecstasy or sorrow. So while you fly around in the heat of the oven, bring in the batter in the pan so we can know exactly what your feelings taste like. So we may be a gourmet of them. All right, I could read this forever. I'm just going to stop right there. But that is really um, such a beautiful metaphor for everything that we need to sort of bring together to the page. We need to have that warmth and that coziness and that that skill of transforming our life stuff into something tasty. But it's worthless if we don't have the life stuff in the first place. Uh, Great stuff. Huge takeaway. Love the section, baking a cake. My seventh takeaway comes from a section called Don't Use Writing to Get Love. One quote is, we are good people before we ever write a word so this is huge and this goes back to that that you know very famous sort of thing that we're we're hearing all the time you are enough and you are right you are enough and very often when we have this dream of being a writer we think you know someday when I get published and my books are on the shelves and I get that you know I can be a bestseller then people will know the real me and see the real me and you're constantly working toward that end and not giving yourself any of the credit that you deserve for simply just being you so I love this section and that she takes the time to not only recognize like yes you we are all good people before we even write anything down 
But then the second part of that section, she talks about when she went to a reading and a friend of hers was like, that was, you know, really great. And she just couldn't hear it. And this was just um, like, this hit me because this is me. I, you know, people can say things and compliment me. And I'm like, they don't really, you know, they're being nice or whatever. Uh, you know, all these <laughs> ridiculous things we tell ourselves. And so it was like one of the last lines that she wrote in this section. She said, build up a tolerance for positive, honest support. And I was like, what? It's so ridiculous that we need to build up a tolerance for positivity. And yet in the same breath, I'm thinking, yes, I personally need to build up a tolerance for positivity being, you know, given to me. So this is huge. And I'm sure I'm not alone. We all have imposter syndrome and various insecurities. And when people try to compliment us, we're like giving all of the, you know, we're dancing around it and saying, no, well, thank you. Yeah. But you didn't see or, or read the last thing I wrote. It was really garbage. And it's like, just, just say thank you and take it for a moment. Um, and it's just, uh, really, really lovely. It's always nice when you hear somebody speaking your truths. And, uh, that was one of those sections. So that's a, that's another takeaway. And I've got only three left, so let's hope I pick out three really good ones. Or at least something that speaks to your truth. The eighth takeaway that I have is the section on syntax that Natalie wrote about. This was like a really bizarre sort of exercise that she suggested that led to this massive epiphany that, I don't know, maybe you guys already, this is clear to you, but I loved it and I did not remember this at all from my first reading so she recommends going through you know your old writing and looking for uh three or four consecutive sentences that really you know nothing that was too exciting and write it on a blank piece of paper and then she says just take those words and start putting them in different order. So I'm imagining that basically like taking your words as if they were magnetic poetry. And of course she wrote this long before magnetic poetry was a thing. Taking your three sentences, I'm breaking the words up and then just like moving them all around. But she says, don't even bother to try to make sense of it. Just move them around and move them around until you have a new configuration of words. And you know, she, she gives an example of three sentences and then she gives an example of how she moves them around and they don't make sense at all when she rewrote them. Let me, um, I'm just going to read for you a couple of sentences, I guess, of the new writing. She says, write, I'm and mouth rather cream, say, eat ice and nothing dry. I write rather say, and my goes cube because and theirs. I mean, it goes on like this. So it makes no kind of sense whatsoever. But she's saying once we read it aloud and we say it as though we're saying something and we try to put inflection on it, um, you know, it really sort of like grates on us. She says, what have we done? Our language is usually locked into a sentence syntax of subject, verb, direct object. There is a subject acting on an object. And so she gives the example of a sentence. I see the dog. And it goes on to explain, you know, like I is the center of the universe. And we forget in our language that while I looks at the dog, the dog is simultaneously looking at us. And she says, and this is where like my brain exploded a little bit. It is interesting to note that in the Japanese language, the sentence would say, I dog seeing. There's an exchange or interaction rather than a subject acting on an object. So she says, if we think in the structure, subject, verb, direct object, then that is how we form our world. By cracking open that syntax, we release energy and are able to see the world afresh and from a new angle. 
uh, later she says, there's a pattern of self-centeredness and egocentricity built into the very structure of our language. And I thought that is something very interesting to think about. So huge takeaway. I don't know that I'm going to be writing my sentences in all gobbledygook, but uh, it was enough for me to read this to truly uh, get the message on that one. And think about how the phrasing and the syntax of our sentences influences the way our stories are told, uh, the way our worlds are built in our stories, and how uh, we have the power to think differently. Huge, huge, big takeaway. My ninth takeaway is another one of those things that's happening all over this book. Um, But in this one section, A Tourist in Your Own Town, uh, Natalie begins by saying, writers write about things that other people don't pay much attention to. And one of the things that she mentions over and over again is how we must be able to see the extraordinary in the ordinary and vice versa, to see the ordinary within the extraordinary. There's another section here that's that's entitled that, where she discusses um, beautiful landscapes in the desert and and how does one describe these mountains and and this desert and, and all of the things that she's seeing that are beyond beautiful to her. And uh, I believe she was visiting or seeing some some people that lived there uh, a tribe and she said to these people this is their ordinary this is their like living room it's no big deal so if you can step into their shoes for a moment and just see the things see the colors see the yeah that's the mountain with the purple on the side and, you know, it's, it shoots straight up on the side like a cliff. You know, almost like when you can just list the details of it. You, when you share those ordinary details, for people who it's ordinary to, they'll say, oh, yeah, the purple mountain with the cliff that shoots straight up in the sky. I know that one. I see it every day. But to people like me, who are nowhere near mountains, and I hear those same quote unquote ordinary details it is enough to bring me to the extraordinary so our job as writers is constantly well here she says a writer's job is to make the ordinary come alive to awaken ourselves to the specialness of simply being and one of the great pieces of advice that Natalie gives over and over in this book is that the way we do that is through specificity and details. So we are constantly aware and and conscious of our present moment and seeing what's all around us, gathering that information, again, going back to baking the cake, gathering the ingredients of what's around us then we can simply translate it, simply explain the ordinary. Um, And there you go. It will be uh, brought to life for the reader. She said, learn to write about the ordinary. Make a list of everything ordinary you can think of. Keep adding to it. Promise yourself before you leave the earth to mention everything on your list at least once in a poem, short story, newspaper article. Her obsession with the ordinary and these details is an incredible takeaway for me because they are the things we take for granted. They are the things we overlook. But when you have that beautiful thing you wrote and you ask yourself, why is this piece singing most of the time it's because it's the piece where you took the time to really dig into the details and 
find and explain the ordinary in the moment. And I love that. So that is a huge takeaway. And I only have one more, even though there are so many more in this book. So let me see what I'll end off with. Okay, the 10th takeaway is something that I've already put into action. This is in the section called Blue Lipstick and a Cigarette Hanging Out of Your Mouth. Uh, This is where Natalie Goldberg talks about bringing a prop to your writing practice. She says, actually, one small prop can often tip your mind into another place. When I sit down to write, often I have a cigarette hanging out of my mouth. If I'm in a cafe that has a no smoking sign, then my cigarette is unlit. I don't actually smoke anyway, so it doesn't matter. The cigarette is a prop to help me dream into another world. It wouldn't work so well if I ordinarily smoked. You need to do something you don't usually do. And this sounds so silly and so hilarious, but we did our reading chats on Thursday night each week in June. And um, right after Tammy O'Quinn, one of the uh, Stop Writing Alone members and Happy Campers hosted her own write-in, which I do believe she's going to keep doing um, in July. So keep an eye on the Stop Writing Alone Facebook group for uh, those announcements each Thursday night. Anyway, we went right into a write-in after discussing this. Uh, We had like a a short break and I said, you know what guys, I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna run around my house and see if I can find a prop to bring to this write-in. And I found one. I found, (laughs) I remembered that uh, last year, my son's birthday theme was Super Mario Brothers. And in his his little uh, bin of Super Mario toys, I was like, I hope we still have one. And we did. We had one of those sticky mustaches that, you know, they look ridiculous, the black mustache. Um, and he had like two left. So I was like, all right, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to use one of these. So I came back to the right end with my big black mustache on <laughs> and I used that as I wrote and it was fascinating. It was really fascinating because at first it was just for a laugh. But when I, when, you know, Tammy set the timer and it was time to write, obviously I couldn't think of anything else but the stupid mustache on my face. And I started writing first about that. And I used the time in a, in a free write in a practice. And I went into a space and uh, writing about a a situation that happened to me when I was like 10 years old that I didn't even like remember before like not a thing that I would have even thought of but it was really such an interesting sort of piece to write and you know after the writing was over I was like wow I don't I don't know that that was really something like there's something there and I'm gonna have to come back to it but um and I say that it definitely wouldn't have happened without that prop so this is this is a really huge takeaway for me. So I guess it is right that I should be ending off with this one because it is something that I'm going to bring with me to at least one write-in every single week of uh, this month. I am challenging myself to bring some sort of prop to my writing. Um, and so I challenge you, whether it is, as Natalie suggested, the cigarette dangling out of your mouth or, as her title suggests, some blue lipstick, something nuts, a weird hat, a different garment of clothing, but something that is not normally you uh, and show up to your writing with it and sort of embody it and see what comes of it. Very interesting stuff, uh, as is most of the stuff that comes from, from Natalie Goldberg. But as you can probably tell, I highly, highly recommend this book if you haven't already um, read it. I will put a link in the show notes so that you can find it. And I will also put a link to uh, Natalie Goldberg's website. This month, we are not reading a book in the Happy Campers Club simply because uh, I and uh, many of the other members are taking on the Camp NaNoWriMo challenge of writing like a book length piece. So we're just using Thursdays as extra uh, write-in times, but we will be picking a writing book 
to read in August. So this month we'll be discussing all the different books that we want to read. I won't make the choice this time. This time I will throw it to the group and see what everybody wants to read. So tune in and see what's coming next and what's the uh, next book I will be giving you big takeaways on. Thank you as always for listening. I cannot thank you enough um, for showing up here. And if you are keeping up with the 52 stories in 52 weeks and want your new prompt, uh, I will be sharing a prompt on Friday afternoon at the NV Rivera YouTube channel. And that is it. So happy writing. I am planning on hosting some write-ins in the Stop Writing Alone Facebook group during the month of July. So two things you can do to make sure that you know about them. Number one is if you're not already in the Facebook group, please ask to join. Uh, simply ask two questions of people that are joining and that's like, what kind of writing do you do? And if you don't know, you can say that honestly, that's fine. You know, if you haven't made like one decision. Um, but also the other question is like, what are you hoping to gain from joining Stop Writing Alone? Uh, and then the other way is to sign up for the newsletter, the email newsletter for Stop Writing Alone. There's a link for that in the uh, show notes, but also if you go to stopwritingalone.com, there is a pop-up there where you just enter your email address and you will get all the updates there. So lots of different ways to connect. We have the at Stop Writing Alone Instagram. Uh, like I mentioned on Facebook, we're there. Uh, on YouTube and on Twitter, I am NV Rivera. Um, yeah, so I hope to hear from you. And if you haven't already reviewed or subscribed to the Stop Writing Alone podcast, I would appreciate either and both. Have a fantastic week. Happy writing to all of you out there who are doing Camp NaNoWriMo. Best of luck. I also have a Stop Writing Alone writing group in Camp NaNoWriMo. If you want to join, just shoot me a direct message. Really, that's it. But again, it's all about stop writing alone. So of course, I'm going to have five bajillion ways that we can connect. Take advantage of it. I want to hear from you. I want to write with you. I want you to stop writing alone. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe to the Stop Writing Alone podcast wherever you're listening to this episode today. Then connect with us on Facebook at Stop Writing Alone Facebook page or in the Stop Writing Alone with Nicole Rivera Facebook group. Check Instagram or Twitter where I'm at NV underscore Rivera to find links to our email newsletter. Happy writing. See you next week.